let's go back to a time when catalogs were blue. The summer 2003 Nintendo catalog. I was about to say holiday gift guide, but you know, I don't know if I think 4th of July is a big time to buy Geist, but Geist hadn't released yet and it wouldn't release for a couple more years because this was right in the middle of the GameCube and Game Boy Advance uh, life cycles. Uh, so you can consider this to be around the height or the, uh, you know, utter decline of, uh, you know, either the Game Boy Advance or GameCube. I think around this time, uh, Nintendo was kind of fighting tooth and nail to try to get the GameCube back on its, on it, uh, on its feet. Uh, try to make it an actual success uh, where, you know, you're, you're gonna see like a ton of game. This was during like the height of just like them trying as much as possible, you know, pumping out as many games as humanly imaginable. Uh, and then on the Game Boy Advance, they're just kind of coasting along. They're just like, hey, you know, I mean, it's a Game Boy Advance. It's gonna do well, so who cares? Yeah, as you can see, this was like right when there was just so much stuff coming out. I mean, right away, you have all these third-party games. You have Mario Golf. You have Mario Kart. Uh, that's Mario World. <laughs> and the first segment here is all about connectivity. Uh, really, really pushing this whole GameCube to Game Boy Advance connectivity shtick. Uh, I, I'm sure they saw a lot of value in kind of, you know, advertising both at the same time. So, you know, if the Game Boy Advance is doing well, then that's some um, potential that the GameCube would do well and vice versa. Um, but here they show a lot of different games that, you know, uh, connect to each other. And what do we have here? Nintendo Puzzle Collection. Uh, that was a Japanese-only release of uh, three uh, Nintendo puzzle games. You had Yoshi's Cookie, Panel de Pan, and Dr. Mario. And uh, it was a GameCube game. Only, only released in Japan, but this shows that they were planning a, uh, a North American release. And then they have Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventures, just called Legend of Zelda Four Swords. I believe the original working title was just, you know, Four Swords for Nintendo GameCube. Uh, kind of like... How they originally announced uh, New Super Mario Brothers Wii is just basically New Super Mario Brothers for Wii. So I, I think that did a bad job kind of showing that this is in fact a completely new game. Uh, but then they also showed Final Fantasy, Crystal Chronicles, Wind Waker, Wario World. Uh, I forgot, Wario World, you pretty much get a, uh, a demo for WarioWare. Uh, and then All-Star Baseball 2004, the epitome of Nintendo Game Boy Advance and GameCube connectivity. Then we have, right over here, the Game Boy Player, the e-reader, the modern adapter, broadband adapter. This looks like a scientific diagram. Like, this is like a diagram showing you what you should and shouldn't eat. It's pretty, it's pretty elaborate, showing just how much you can connect to the GameCube. Uh, and a lot of it can, uh, had something to do with the Game Boy Advance. And then we have just like all the different ways you can do, you know, pretty much how you do, uh, e-reader connectivity. Um, the e-reader is still, in my opinion, one of Nintendo's biggest flops in terms of just intuitiveness. Uh, just the fact that, uh, for Game Boy Advance games with e-reader support, you had to do something along the lines of connect the e-reader to a Game Boy Advance, then connect that Game Boy Advance via, via a link cable, uh, to the other Game Boy Advance, then swipe a card on that other Game Boy Advance to then have stuff appear in the Game Boy Advance game with e-reader support. That's f***ed up! Developers are finding all kinds of cool ways co to connect the Nintendo GameCube and the Game Boy Advance. Whether you're uploading your stable of Pokemon into Pokemon Coliseum or expanding your football strategy in Madden 04, you'll soon find the Game Boy Advance to be an indispensable gaming tool. So, uh, yeah. Uh, they were really pushing this, uh, and didn't really work. But hey, it's still a really cool uh, aspect of this era is just like all this kind of random wacky stuff. Because the GameCube was an era where like you kind of got the games that you you pretty much wanted, you know, like this was this was a pretty traditional game console by Nintendo. But they still found these like really random little little dumb nuggets of things they could do their their little their little shticks in, which which I like. I uh, hear they're advertising F Zero GX. Anytime they did such a thing, uh, I actually didn't know they did the. I, actually, I think I remember uh, hearing that they did the uh, the Spice GameCube uh, controller here but not the actual uh, GameCube console itself. And then I didn't actually know about this color, at least in North America. I mean, I, I don't really remember seeing this color that much at all in general. The Indigo 
clear controller where the back is clear. That's actually really neat. Uh, and then we go over to the Game Boy Advance. This was uh, during both the original Advance and the uh, SP. Uh, really didn't have that many colors, at least on display here, uh, where they just have Arctic, Indigo, F Fuchsia, Glacier, Platinum, and that was pretty much it. Um, I remember like a, a jet black one, uh, you know, like I, I believe that was available early on, so, you know, this might have been one, like they just weren't doing that at the moment. Uh, but yeah, the SP, Cobalt and Platinum. S uh, still the best, one of the best Nintendo handhelds, just with how versatile it was, how big of an upgrade it was. Literally, like, the only problem with it was the lack of a headphone jack. That's it. And when that's your only problem, like, uh, that's a pretty good system. And we have the Game Boy Player. Uh, this still retains a lot of its value because of just, like, again, it's pretty much like the Game Boy Advance SP of, uh, accessories, where you can play literally every, or pretty much all the Game Boy games. Uh, you know, you can't play Game Boy Advance video cartridges. Wah. But this is still, like, an amazing accessory. And they're playing a little bit of Metroid Fusion there, and they're showing, you know, stuff like, you know, you get Advance Wars with the different borders. Uh... It's just, it was a great accessory, and I love seeing these older uh, CRT TVs uh, on display in the advertisements. I, I absolutely adore that. Then we have the e-reader. Just just a very interesting, I, I was, uh, af after looking into it, it's obvious that this was originally meant as an accessory pretty much just for Pokemon cards. And that makes total sense, but then Nintendo wanted it to have a bit more mass appeal. Um, so they did, you know, not only can you scan Pokemon cards, but you can scan other things. and. It just, it never worked out. Uh, it, you know, again, like, this doesn't look like an accessory for the Game Boy Advance. You look at this and it looks like something else. It doesn't look like a Nintendo-made product. It looks like a third-party accessory. It looks like a, uh, what's, oh my god. Oh my god. Action replay. And we have, uh, yeah, pretty much all the, uh, different ways you can connect an e-reader. Uh, or at least connecting it to to a GameCube, and then uh, we have the uh, the other uh, e-reader cards, including the uh, never released Game and Watch ones, uh, which is very interesting. These are these are cool. I, I like these. I wish they would have released, but they never did. Um, these released though, the original NES games. Uh, you know, like the <sighs> okay. So I think the Game and Watch ones would have been a lot cooler because you only really have to slide them once. That's the thing. Like, uh, the NES games pretty much come on five cards, and you have to slide them all individually to get the game to load. Which, you know, hey, still, the NES game is on five cards, but I think sliding five cards <laughs> isn't as cool as just sliding one, and then bam, you get the game. Uh, and then Mario Party E. Mario is throwing another party, and it's f***ing weird! Yeah, so Mario Party E is an incredibly bizarre... Mario Party game. I mean, it's pretty cool, all things considered. Uh, just the fact that they tried to take Mario Party and transform it into kind of a more physical, physical card game format. I think that's pretty neat. Uh, I think it would still be really cool if, like, Nintendo partnered with, you know, some, you know, a manufacturer that works with board games and they created a legitimate physical Mario Party kind of board game kind of thing. Um, but I think at that point you might as you might ask, like, why don't I just play regular Mario Party on the video game? Um, but, yeah, Mario Party, I still have to play this. And I cannot wait to do so. I do have it. It's it's on my shelf right over there. It's really odd. And I can't wait to. Uh, just the fact that, you know, you play with cards and then and then you play the mini games on the e-reader or the Game Boy Advance. That's, a, that's actually a really fun concept. I really do like that. Um, the problem is... Uh, it was called Mario Party E, uh, the Pokemon trading card game with e-reader uh, functionality, which uh, I'm surprised they never did that with Amiibo. You know, like, out of all things that would have worked well with Amiibo, I think Pokemon would have been perfect for it, yet they only had, like, they only had, like, two uh, two major Pokemon releases as Amiibo. They had, like, uh, Shadow Mewtwo, the card that was included with uh, the first Prince of uh, Pokemon Tournament on Wii U, and then they had Detective Pikachu, and then that was it. And that one was big for some reason. Like, they, they just decided to make it really big. Uh, I don't know if there was any legitimate reason behind that other than that's kind of cool. Um, but, uh, is that hair? That's hair. Uh, Game Boy Advance AC adapter set. Interesting. That, that's interesting. Like, okay, so that was for the original Game Boy Advance. 
I did not know that. It was a thing. Uh, so yeah, that was not for the SP. That was for the uh, original Game Boy Advance, which is which is pretty neat. They have the component video cables, available only through Nintendo. So these component video cables are some of the more expensive uh, GameCube accessories. I'm sure now they're not as expensive because they're not as lucrative. This was the kind of like the only method for a while there to get like the best picture quality out of your GameCube. Um, but uh, since then we have a lot of like HDMI solutions, pretty much ways to play uh, your GameCube via HDMI. I have the Eon adapter and it works beautifully. So there's no real point to the component video cable unless you want to play on like an older TV. Um, but even the HDMI adapter makes the games look wonderful on HD TV. So, you know, I, I don't really think they have as much of a point. But uh, yeah, these were our, these were only available through Nintendo directly. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah, you can only get it through like uh, you know their phone or, or potentially on their website. Uh, you know, it was just oh, but you could also get the RF switch. So you know, <laughs> options. Here we go into the GameCube section. This is where they uh, they talk about uh, the GameCube games coming out or they, that were already out around this time. Pretty much the stuff they were really advertising. Uh, and we have Mario Kart Double Dash, uh, which is easily like one of, I, I think it is the second best-selling GameCube game. I believe Melee was the first, but yeah, what an amazing game. Uh, I want to play this with, with the guys soon. Uh, we, we did the, uh, we did, the, we did the unthinkable and we played through, uh, Mario Kart Wii where like every, uh, every course in a row, <laughs> every, every track in a row, it doesn't take as long as you think it would. It only took like two hours. Uh, but, but we did like, you know, uh, 150 CC, uh, all, uh, all CPUs on like hard, uh, the items were set to aggressive and it was amazing. Uh, and Mario Kart Double Dash is a tough game when you get down to it. Like it is, it, it's interesting to kind of compare the Mario Karts like in terms of uh, difficulty, um, because this this is like one of the this is one of the harder ones uh, to play through. Uh, Mario Kart Wii is surprisingly super difficult for how casual the Wii is. Like like that game can get intense. Uh, and then when you get to stuff like you know Mario Kart Seven, Mario Kart Eight, that's when things start to get a lot easier. Uh, you know, some would consider them fair. I, I think this is a really good one, really difficult, but, you know, really fun time. Uh, and then we have another racing game, F-Zero GX, another, like, really tough as nails, but I played this recently again, and it is awesome. It is so immaculate. Uh, it is just, it is beautiful. It controls so well. It's just such a fun game good experience and it's fantastic you know to be fair you know like if the f-zero series really ended at gx and it, it technically didn't because there were some game boy advance ones but in terms of console ones if it really ended at gx i think that, uh, you know going out on a high note it's it's a really good one now mario golf this was a very sports and racing centric year uh or at least like at first i'm sure if we go a little deeper yeah there's some more stuff but yeah, uh, this was a pretty sports-centered year. We have Mario Golf, uh, still the, one of the best uh, console Mario Golf games. I mean, there's only like really like three, but uh, this was a really good one. Uh, I've been playing Super Rush a little bit more, and I'm just like, ah, god damn it! That game is just incredibly disappointing. Uh, and they and they started to add stuff later on that was like, oh man, all right, all right, more of this, please. Like I played their new Donk City course, and I was like, this is great. But that's like the only damn one in the game that's like that. And I'm like, come on. So Mario Golf Toadstool Tour still cannot be topped. Uh, 1080 Avalanche. Yeah, this is a, an interesting uh, release considering, uh, I don't know. I just never hear anybody talk about Avalanche. Uh, I think Wave Race always got kind of the uh, attention. And I think it's mainly because there's not a lot of water skiing games. 1080 Avalanche, there, there's quite a few snowboarding games out there. It's, even nowadays, you know, you have Steep. Uh, nowadays, but back then you had SSX. Um, so it's just like a comparative, like, uh, you know, like there's just not a, as much uniqueness about 1080, but it's still a great, it's still a great time. You can pick or choose whether you like the N64 one or the GameCube one more, but you know, I, I think this was a great time where Nintendo just had so much variety in their lineup. It wasn't just Mario. It wasn't just, you know, their big franchise. They would do stuff like this and they would try to do more uh, legitimate sports titles like this. I, I think that was a really cool experience. 
uh, Pikmin 2. Uh, and this was probably about, yeah, a year or so before Pikmin 2 actually came out. Because I think Pikmin 2 is a 2004 joint. Yeah, Pikmin 2 is still the only Pikmin game that I haven't beaten. Just because th this thing is long. <laughs> this this thing is an experience. Uh, but, I mean, I love all the Pikmin games. I still love Pikmin 2. It's just, it is definitely the weirdest one of the bunch. Uh, if you don't want to count Hey Pikmin. Um, which, alright. And I ran about that. Like, out of all 2D games... To not include a time limit. I don't understand why Hey Pikmin doesn't have a time limit. That's like, it's Pikmin. Why doesn't the damn game have a time limit? Here we have Wario World, which, again, this is this is very much in line with, like, what I'm talking about. Where Nintendo was just doing a bunch of random junk back then. Where they were like, hey, screw it, yeah, Wario gets a 3D platformer. Uh, this is definitely, like, it, it is a fine game. It's a perfectly fine game, but, uh, you know, I, I think there's a reason why they didn't really keep going forward with a 3D Wario formula. It's a bit generic, all things considered, um, but, you know, like, I, I think you can play the game and you can see a lot of, like, modern Nintendo DNA. Like, I feel like you can look at that and you can kind of see, like, a bit of a precursor to games like Mario 3D Land or Mario 3D World, which is kind of like the fixed camera and, and all that. So I, I think it definitely has a, you know, it definitely has its place. It's a fine game, but, you know, like, it, it just, it, it wasn't, like, anything, it, it wasn't anything earth-shattering. I think that was, that was just the main thing. But I, I do like, I do like how they were willing to do something like that. Where they were like, hey, yeah, screw it, let's do a 3D Wario platformer. Uh, and this is what I was talking about, the Legend of Zelda Four Swords for Nintendo GameCube, even though it's, you know its own game and then it, that name just kind of implies that it's four swords on the gamecube that's all it is that's all it will ever be it's four swords on the gamecube but no, me and my friends played this recently it's a fantastic time uh it's it's definitely a bit of a it, it's definitely a bit of a uh you have to do a lot to set up it uh you know i i still maintain would have been perfect on wii u uh, especially, like, even if, like, oh, you can only use one gamepad, even just doing something like, you know, like, having the other players use 3DSs, um, even on the Switch, you know, just having other people use Switches and it's online, I don't know, man, like, there's just so many ways they could bring this game back, and they could put it in a much more, just, like, accessible format. Uh, but instead you have to get, you know, the game and the GameCube and four Game Boy Advances and four GameCube to Game Boy Advance link cables. It's a mess, but it's a good game to go through that mess for. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of games on GameCube that use the Game Boy Advances as, as well. So it's just like, hey, when you do all that, play some Pac-Man Versus. Uh, it's just like, hey, come on, you deserve a treat. There's so many fun games that do that with. Um, I still haven't played Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles uh, on the GameCube. Uh, I don't want to play the remaster. Yeah, I, I think, tr you know, trying out all the GameCube, the uh, Game Boy Advance connectivity, that's something I want to do eventually, because I've done it with a couple of games, but uh, I definitely want to play this more, and uh, I definitely want to try out Final Fantasy. Um, but, why do that when we can try out Star Fox? Yeah, this is Star Fox Assault. This was uh, back when, like, I remember uh, even at, like, their E3 2004 press conference, they still just called it Star Fox. And, uh, yeah, I think they, uh, they kind of wanted to, uh, do a more traditional Star Fox game after Star Fox Adventures was a bit controversial. I think most people look at that game with a lot of love these days, uh, just because they were like, ah, this is pretty cool. But, you know, like, Star Fox Assault was kind of, like, a way to kind of bring things back. And, uh, a lot of people love Assault. But, uh, yeah, I, it, it didn't really, I, I don't know, like, it, it didn't really leave a huge impression on people at the time. Uh, other than, you know, people that grew up with it a lot. You know, it's just interesting to look back on because Star Fox Assault was pretty much the exact game that people were asking for and uh, it didn't leave much of an impression. It's just interesting because like, I'm, you know, it's like one of those things where I'm like, all right, what, what does Nintendo do with this franchise? Because <laughs> like when people get what they want, it doesn't leave much of an impression. When they tr and then when they tried to do something new, people hate it. But yeah, this was one of Nintendo's first major uh, collaborations with kind of like another company. I mean, they've done it before, you know, F-Zero GX was you know, with Amusement Vision or Sega, um, but this was, uh, this was developed by Namco, and, uh, you know, I, it, this was kind of, like, in there, you know, like, you, you were starting to see, like, Nintendo kind of transition to working with more partners, um, you know, for example, you know, Metroid now is, you know, 2D Metroid is developed by Mercury Steam, and then you have, like, the Zelda remasters that have, like, Grezzo, and, and all of this stuff where it's just, like, you have, specific teams that aren't aren't really like actually owned by Nintendo they just work with Nintendo and uh, Star Fox Assault was kind of one of the first uh, major kind of uh, third-party collaborations like that 
which is uh, interesting. And I think Namco did a damn good job. I, th I think they did a great job. It's just kind of hard to uh, kind of translate Star Fox to, uh, you know, a modern day kind of thing. Uh, but I think they did a good job with Assault. Assault's still a really solid time. Then we have Kirby Air Ride. Uh, people adore this game. Uh, I played it a little bit and I like it, uh, but you know, I, I, I haven't played it enough to really be like, oh yeah, this is exactly, like this game is amazing. Uh, it's just pretty good. I, I'm like, I, I kind of like it. It's pretty interesting. You know, City Trial is a good time. And then you also have like, uh, just, just the concept of it alone is just kind of taking a lot of the ethos of Kirby. Because Kirby is supposed to be like, oh, this is like a platformer for beginners. Um, you know, something that everybody can enjoy, but even like the youngest, dumbest people <laughs> can enjoy it. And uh, I think uh, Sakurai kind of put that ethos into Kirby Air Ride. Where, uh, you know, it, it's it's a racing game with one button. That's what it is. And I, I think that's really cool how they were able to kind of make it work like that. I just remember at the time, it just kind of got a bit of a flag. A flag. I remember like IGN gave it like a 5 out of 10. And I'm just like, <laughs> you have to be the most cold-hearted son of a bitch to give this a 5 out of 10. Pokemon Coliseum. Uh, th this was pretty uh, interesting how they were willing to kind of fudge the rules a little bit, at least at the time. Uh, because at the time, uh, Game Freak and the Pokemon Company and all that, they were pretty adamant. They were like, we are not going to do a Pokemon RPG uh, or like a mainline Pokemon game on consoles. They work best on handhelds. Uh, but they kind of fudged it a little bit with Pokemon Coliseum where, you know, it's, it's a sequel to Pokemon Stadium on the, um, N64, or Pokemon, the, the series, because there were three of them, or two in North America. But, there's like this full-blown RPG mode, and, uh, they really, really leaned into that with, like, Pokemon XD. This, this was kind of like, hey, you get, like, a, a big Pokemon adventure on, uh, on GameCube. It wasn't the same. Wasn't the same at all, but uh, you know, like I just find it interesting that you know the GameCube out of all systems got kind of like this full-blown big 3D Pokemon Pokemon RPG, um, even if it wasn't a mainline Pokemon game. Um, and just the fact that they had two Pokemon RPGs on the GameCube in 3D and all that stuff, and it still didn't do as well as it could as it could have. Um, you know, I, I think it's just like, man, like, I, you know, it's it's hard to imagine what could have saved the game, uh, GameCube at the time. Even though, you know, putting a, an actual mainline Pokemon game probably would have helped a little bit, but, but I don't know. Moving on to uh, Star Wars Rebel Strike, Rogue, Squad uh, Rogue Squadron 3. Um, I'm not a Star Wars guy, but it, it's interesting to look back at this generation and see pretty much like each console had kind of their own exclusive Star Wars games. And uh, Nintendo had the... Um, the Rogue Squadron series. Uh, the first one, Rogue Squadron, uh, oh my god, this is really, Rogue Squadron 2 was absolutely, like, I mean, these games graphically look insane, even today. Like, I, they, they do such a good job with lighting and the models and all of that to just, like, they just look like the movies. It's, it's really, it's really crazy. Like, they just look really damn good. Um, and two was like a big deal at, at launch. Like that was like, that was one of the major, uh, launch titles that people picked up right alongside Luigi's Mansion and Wave Race and Monkey Ball. Uh, those were kind of the main, uh, those were kind of the main ones because outside of that, there was like Batman Vengeance, Tarzan. Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles. I still haven't played this game. All right. So this is like, kind of like the big, like, oh man, this is like Nintendo really trying here. Uh, Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes. Uh, I wish they would try something like this again, where, uh, Nintendo just, like, goes to a company and is just like, hey, remake this, this classic game that was never on Nintendo platforms and just do something wild. Still one of the only major Metal Gear games to appear on Nintendo. I mean, you have, like, the first two, or, I mean, not, not even the first two, technically just the first game on NES, because there's a sequel to Metal Gear on NES that that's just like Snake's Revenge and, and that's all it really is is a sequel to the NES port didn't really have any uh affiliation to the rest of the series but then you also had uh Twin Snakes and then you had uh Metal Gear 3D uh Snake Eater on the 3DS and that's pretty much it Th this this series history on Nintendo is pretty damn good it's just the fact that like you get Twin Snakes and Twin Snakes is a little divisive, you know, like it, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a uh, massive remake of just kind of taking uh, Metal Gear Solid and just upgrading it 
but also changing a lot and, and changing a lot of like the context or like slash uh, a, a lot of the uh, feeling behind the game. This game is so over the top. There's like people are doing backflips and, and it's crazy. Uh, and I think it's really cool. I, I think it's a great supplemental title to the first game. Uh, I don't really know. It definitely doesn't replace it, but it's a really cool remake, I think. Uh, just the fact that it kind of takes Metal Gear Solid and, and, and pretty much takes it and upgrades it to Metal Gear Solid 2 territory. Um, I think I think that's pretty cool. And then you have Resident Evil 4. And if you can see here, uh, this, this is not our Resident Evil 4. This is uh, kind of when the game was uh, in a bit of a different state. Resident Evil 4 went through so many different uh, iterations. And uh, this is kind of like the second to last one. Um... I believe, you know, this This was when it was, like, straight up a much more, like, survival horror game rather than kind of the more action-y take that uh, Resi 4 turned into. You can see, like, it's just, like, it's a little, it's a little, it looks a little more like traditional Resident Evil, but from, you know, behind the back perspective. Then we have uh, Sonic Adventure DX. I personally always thought that was a fun way to, uh, <laughs> a fun, a fun little pun. I, I only really remember, I mean, technically, no, like, like that was Adventure 2 Battle. Uh, I only really got that, uh, got that game through the uh, experience of watching trailers in Sonic Mega Collection and very little else. And I remember seeing a lot of uh, Sonic Adventure DX via like magazine ads and on the store shelves. And uh, I always thought the uh, box art looked fucking disgusting. And I still haven't really played through Sonic Adventure, but that'll happen. Eh, that'll happen eventually. Um, I'm interested to see if, uh, you know, I can learn to uh, love it. Because, like, just just from, like, the little that I played, it's not my thing. Uh, I'm not going to call it a bad game, because it's not a bad game. Uh, but, you know, uh, you know, it's just not necessarily my thing, but I think I just need to give it more of a chance. And Killer7, part of the Capcom uh, exclusive lineup that they, uh, they positioned for the GameCube that... Uh, were exclusive at some point, or they were poised to be exclusive, and then, uh, nope. Same here. I mean, PN03, project num uh, product number 03, was uh, the only one that I think stayed exclusive. That that's the only one that it's still exclusive for a matter for a matter of fact. Beautiful Joe uh, came over to PS2, uh, and uh, Resident Evil 4 came over to PS2. I think right before right before uh, it released for GameCube, Capcom announced like, oh Jesus Christ, it's coming to PS2, please God. Red Faction 2, Rayman 3, I mean like, the GameCube still got a decent amount of third party support. It just wasn't like the exact third party support that it needed. I think like if Grand Theft Auto and the Metal Gears at the time came over, then you know, we might be talking different, but uh, you know, like it, it just didn't get like a lot of the major ones that, that really, really, really mattered. A lot of the game, even then, a lot of the games were exclusive to PS2, like Kingdom Hearts and the Final Fantasies. But, you know, you got Splinter Cell and you got Soul Calibur 2, the best version of Soul Calibur 2, considering Link was in there. I think it's fun that, you know, they advertise uh, the fact that, hey, you know, Link's in the game, and it sold the best uh, on GameCube. I think that's why Sony uh, tried to get Soul Calibur 3 exclusive, because uh, Soul Calibur 3 was exclusive to the PS2, which I thought was just kind of dumb. Uh, I think I think Sony was a little, you know, a little butthurt that, uh, so Calibur 2 sold the best on, on GameCube, so they were like, uh... Gladius, I played this via a demo disc. I... Uh, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. Uh, really great, really cool game. Uh, and then we also have uh, the sports titles. Again, you know, GameCube got a decent amount of support. You did have the sports titles on here, even if, like, they were a bit, they were a bit gimped. Uh, they weren't, like, you know, the, be the best versions of the sports titles, because a lot of them didn't include online play. Uh, and then we have Def, Jeff, Def Jam Vendetta and uh, NBA Street, uh, NBA Street V2. Um, and then we have kind of like the uh, the weird ones. Actually, no, I I take back whatever I said at the beginning. F yes. But before we get into that, uh, Mario Party Five. Look at that logo. That that that's messed up. Uh, that's interesting that they were trying to kind of a different format for that logo style. I'm mostly a uh, I, I I I haven't played much of Mario Party Five. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of the the one board that I played. I, I don't even know. I don't think it was the board necessarily. I just wasn't really a fan of five that much. I love six and seven, and four is great too. Uh, four feels like a legitimate like classic N sixty four Mario Party, but just in this weird like like they they go for this really oddball realism in Mario Party four, 
where it's just like everything looks kind of realistic and it's really messed up. Um, but as I was saying at the beginning, look at that. That's Nintendo Puzzle Collection, even with an English logo and all that. So they were really planning on bringing this game over. And uh, frankly, like I don't really see much of a reason why they uh, they shouldn't have brought it over. It's pretty simple. It's just a puzzle game. Uh, or it's just a collection of puzzle games. And uh, yeah, they were bringing over Panel Day Pond alongside with it. And it looks like they were just going to call it Panel Day Pond. Because uh, Panel Day Pond has been under numerous different names. Uh, puzzle League, Tetris Attack, all that. And um, yeah, you know, they were just willing to just call it Panel Day Pond just straight up, which is very cool. Yeah, they just decided uh, against, uh, against bringing it over. Which uh, I'd recommend, you know, out of all uh, GameCube games to import, this is one of the cooler ones because you don't really need to know Japanese to, to get a lot out of this. Uh, Dr. Mario in this game is literally basically just Dr. Mario 64. Yoshi's Cookie is a completely original version of Yoshi's Cookie, which is really neat. And then uh, Panel Day Pond is, uh, is the unreleased Nintendo 64 version of that, which again, like it's just, it's a really cool collection. Um, and it shows that they were they were interested in bringing it over, but it just it never happened. Uh, and then we have Geist, uh, and then Lost Kingdoms 2, which is uh, from software a joint, which is uh, which is really cool. Uh, and then we have Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg. Uh, I recently got this game. I, I bought a uh, a version of it uh, on eBay that looked disgusting, and I spent way too much. I spent like sixty bucks on it or something, and uh, I bought it because I thought it was funny. <laughs> And this is one of my worst moments ever. Uh, it was because it looked so bad. I wanted to own it because <laughs> it was like it was such a horrible conditioned version of Billy Hatcher. And I was just like, that's kind of funny. <laughs> so I bought it. Uh, and I, I haven't I haven't slept since. Uh, then we have WrestleMania uh, 007. This is during a really fun era uh, for 007 games. Just the fact there was a ton of them. There's a ton of them. And I, I love the 007 games from this era. And even like into the 360 Wii era. You know, I, I love GoldenEye on Wii. I think that game is fantastic and, and gets a lot of hate. Um, but I, I love that game. And I think it's really cool to have kind of like these first person shooters that don't take themselves that seriously. That are just a little more fun. That aren't, you know, bloody and gory and, and messed up. They, they don't, they're, they're not aimed to shock you or, or, or give you like anything more than just kind of a fun, a bit more of a lighthearted tone. Um, I, I just think that's important. I, I think it's great to have kind of more teen rated uh, first person shooters that are kind of similar to like what you'd get out of a Call of Duty, but they're a little more lighthearted. They don't, they don't make you feel kind of like sad. Because <laughs> um, like sometimes Call of Duty can get really intense in terms of like the storylines and just like you know, it's just stuff that's just like, ah, oh, that's kind of, that's kind of screwed up. And, you know, I think a 007 game, you know, it, it's kind of, it's kind of unfortunate that they just, after 007 Legends, they just haven't really done anymore. I think having games like that is just, it's just kind of important. Uh, Harry Potter Quidditch World Cup, I bought that at GameStop for like five bucks back in the day, and I played it for a little bit, and I didn't really know what I was doing. So... Onto uh, Wolverine's Revenge and uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Celebrity Death. Whoa, that was on GameCube. Like, don't don't quote me on this, but I don't think that came to GameCube. I, I think that version might have been uh, might have been canceled. Huh. One second. Uh, yeah, I just looked it up, and yeah, this game never came to GameCube. It only came to PS2 and uh, Xbox and PlayStation One and like PC at the time. Uh, why do I know that? Because. Uh, I remember seeing this show on TV randomly via like reruns and uh, it grossed me the hell out <laughs> uh, But it never left my mind because it was like such a it, it was such an unapologetically gory claymation show um, And uh, it just it just stuck in my mind as a kid uh, I only watched like one episode of it and I was just like that's messed up uh, I've been using that phrase a lot today. This game never came to GameCube Rated T, but uh, yeah, I, I I do know this also because like I like this this era of licensed games where I feel like literally everything got a license a licensed game. Um, I've been buying a lot of random junk on PS2 that I just think is really interesting. There was an El Tigre game, which was a Nickelodeon show that ran for like one season in 2008, and I got a PS2 game. And then you also have Aqua T uh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Uh, which got a PS2 game. The Sopranos got a PS2 game. It's just a lot of random stuff like that. And Looney Tunes back in action. The live action movie got a got a game like this. That did come out on GameCube. Burnout 2. 
Uh, Burnout 3, I think, was supposed to come out on GameCube, but uh, never did. Uh, but yeah, that, that was kind of the last uh, Burnout game on GameCube. Um, what, Drome Racer? Lego Street Cars? What? Man, this is weird. Like, I've never heard of it. So this is like a Lego brand kind of thing. I never knew that. I, I looked it up and I'm just like, whoa, what? Because like, I remember Bionicle from back in the day. Like, Bionicle was kind of like badass Lego. Uh, and then this was kind of, I, I guess this was kind of going for a similar deal, but, you know, kind of more of like, you know, Lego cars, but for, you know, older kids, I guess. I, I never knew that was a thing. Very interesting. Uh, Spy Hunter 2 and Crash Nitro Kart, kind of going in the racing section here. Oh! Yeah, a lot of, a lot of major stuff, except, uh, you know, you have Medal of Honor here, but pretty much all a bunch of, uh, licensed stuff here. But, uh, Battle for Bikini Bottom! That's awesome! Um, and I like how they even mention Revenge of the Flying Dutchman here. Fresh from his fracas with the Flying Dutchman, SpongeBob Squarepants is back for more 3D action! Uh, I kind of, I think that's kind of funny. Uh, cause, uh... Whatever. That wasn't a good game. Uh, but Battle for Bikini Bottom is a good game. I think people kind of hyperbolize how good of a game it is. I remember when, uh, you know, like, a, a lot of people would, like, ask their favorite YouTube channels or something to play the game. They were like, you gotta play Battle for Bikini Bottom. And it would be, like, a 30-plus-year-old dude who plays games. And he's just like, I don't, I don't know what the... <laughs> I don't know what the big deal of this game is. Like, and, and the same happened when, like, Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated came out. I feel like it was almost kind of embarrassing to see, like, people who didn't grow up with the game be forced into playing it from people who grew up with the game. I'm just like, you're not going to like what they're going to say. Um, that being said, I think a lot of people a lot of people go into the game with a little too high of expectations. The game is good. It's a good, solid kids game. Um, and even looking past it being a kids game, it's, it's a pretty decent little platformer. I think it's kind of in the same league as something like, you know, like Super Lucky's Tale or something where it's just like, you can play that and be like, this is good, this is fine. Um, but you know, the same with like Super Lucky's Tale, you have to look at it from the perspective of like, oh, well it's an Xbox One platformer, so like, this is all we're getting, that's pretty good. Same for like Sackboy, A Big Adventure, which I think that game is underrated. Like, I'm not like it's an it's no, amazing, amazing game, but it's it's pretty good. I Like, if, if anybody com complains about that game, I feel like, th like, if that game was published by Nintendo, you'd be eating that thing up. Like, it, it's literally pretty much the same thing as, like, Mario 3D World, but I digress. Um, pretty much, like, I, I think it all depends on perspective. It all depends on, on all that. And I think, like, when you look at Battle for Bikini Bottom on its own, it's kind of like, ah, this game is, is okay. It's, it's decent. Um, but looking at it from the perspective of a kid who played it in 2003 and the perspective that, you know, it was kind of hard to get like a good kids game like this back in the, you know, like, it's just like, it, it was amazing. Um, but from any other perspective, I think it's kind of hard to see that. And I think people kind of overhype it a lot because they, they love the game as a kid. Um, but I, 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 I still, I, I like this game quite a bit. Uh, and then we have all the sports games right here. And then there's also, uh, ooh, Custom Robo with a, with a different logo. That's, that's pretty neat. Uh, Fantasy Star Online. Oh, man, there's a lot of rent. Pitfall Harry? Come on. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I forget what the actual name of this game is. Um, I just know there was a Pitfall game during this era. And, uh, it was not called Pitfall Harry. I do know that. Uh, Mace Griffin Bounty Hunter. Uh, Terminator 3, uh, Conflict Desert Storm, Simpsons Hit and Run, another, another game from this era. I think anybody who likes, who likes, uh, a lot of the people who like this game, uh, and this game are part of the same Venn diagram. Like, it's, it's, there's a lot of overlap of just, like, people who really liked, uh, Simpsons Hit and Run and Battle for Bikini Bottom. And I was one of those people. Uh, this was kind of my version of a Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, I loved The Simpsons at the time, so it was just like to be able to get this game and also get kind of a Grand Theft Auto experience because I liked having those open world games where I could just dick around and just run around and just do whatever. And this game gave me that ability. It, it wasn't as elaborate as a Grand Theft Auto and it wasn't as good as a Grand Theft Auto, but it did a, it did a really good job, I think. Um, giving a T-rated Grand Theft Auto experience, pretty much. Uh, and then we have a lot of the other kind of like lower tier games aquaman uh jimmy neutron jet fusion uh which uh i owned a lot of the nickelodeon games i never owned any of the jimmy neutron ones unfortunately because like looking back that's one of the better shows i'm like i owned the fairly odd parents ones and I i'd rather watch jimmy neutron than fairly odd parents these days but yeah, i i never owned any of the jimmy neutron games uh on uh on gamecube i owned a uh, jimmy neutron versus jimmy uh uh negatron on uh, game boy advance 
and then I also own that game via a demo on PC. And uh, there was there was this uh, section where uh, you were playing as Jimmy going through like the the pyramids. You, you were in the desert. You were in like Egypt or, or something. It was it was crazy. But um yeah, like I, I only really remember those. But uh yeah, I have a lot of memories of playing that. Uh, I don't even remember if they were good memories. I don't remember like being like these games are amazing. But as a kid, you're just kind of like you'll, you'll just you'll play whatever. Uh, Shrek Super Party. I played that as a uh, as a kid at a friend's house on PS2. And then uh, Attack versus Attack and the Power of Juju, which was another game. I just remember seeing that it was a Nickelodeon game based on nothing. It was like an original Nickelodeon game, and it eventually got like a TV show, like four years later. Like the TV show came out in like 2007. This game came out in 2003, and I think the original plan was for them to do like uh, the video game and then base the tv show off the video game but the tv show came out like years down the line so it was just kind of strange um but yeah i remember i remember seeing a lot about this game like via uh nickelodeon games uh you'd always get like a section on the nickelodeon games that showed you trailers for other nickelodeon games and uh attack was one of them and uh yeah i remember uh attack 2 the staff of dreams was like a really like, that was legitimately, like, kind of, like, a big upgrade that was, like, oh, wow, th this series might be actually pretty good. And then there was, like, a third one, and then they did another one on, like, Wii and PS2 that wasn't as good. That, that was kind of an interesting uh, era, and it was an interesting series on, on these, uh, during this generation. Wallace and Gromit and Project Zoo. I want to know how anybody really, uh... Learn learned about Wallace and Gromit back in the day just because it was a it was a British it was a it was a British series of shorts. I I discovered it through the movie that released here uh, in 2005 called Curse of the Were Rabbit, and then after that I watched like the shorts on DVD, um, and I and I really enjoyed them. Uh, but back in 2003, I'm just wondering. I mean, like obviously there were VHS tape releases and whatnot, but uh, it's just interesting that they decided to bring that uh bring it out here. Um, just because it's obviously, it's obviously much bigger in, like, the UK. But, um, you know, it's, they still have their fans over here. Um, we have Piglet's Big Game. Uh, I remember watching this movie in the theater. Uh, I remember specifically, uh, there was, there was a near-death scene. Um, it was, like, it was, it was, like, uh, somebody, somebody was, like, about to die in, like, in, the, like, a waterfall kind of thing. And then, um... And, and then, like, uh, Piglet saved him or, or something. I don't know. Uh, but uh, I remember that. So I looked it up on YouTube. I looked up Piglet Big Movie Death Scene. And weirdly enough, that's the exact title of the scene somebody uploaded it <laughs> under YouTube as. Uh, Backyard Baseball came to GameCube. I didn't know that. That's, that's, a, that's really cool. I remember playing that PC game at my cousin's house. Uh, and then, uh, oh, man, these, these, are getting, these are getting even smaller. Uh, Harvest Moon, uh, Rogue Ops, Army Men. Like, okay, the... Like, these are both, like, feel like, like, bottom of the barrel. Like, I remember, if, if I ever see an Army Men game on, like, N64 or GameCube, it's always going to be, like, uh, it just looks like, oh, God, I'm gonna, I am got to stay away from this. It just looks cheap. It just looks like, ah, oh, Jesus. Ultimate Muscle, Go Go Hypergram, Mega Man uh, Network Transmission, Ikaruga. That's pretty cool. Um, oh, my God. This might be, like, the worst page in GameCube history. We're, like... <laughs> Like, I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody would even be upset with me saying, I think this is the worst two pages. What the hell are these games? This page ain't much better. You have Frogger's Adventures, which this was during a, um, odd era for Frogger. Where they, they were doing, like, yearly Frogger releases. And you're doing, like, 3D, some 3D platformer. I mean, it was one 3D platformer, and these were a little more akin to, like, traditional Frogger gameplay, but they still weren't that great. Um, this was during a weird era where, like, man, Frogger just gave off like huge leapfrog vibes or like you remember leapfrog which is kind of like the children's edutainment brand where they would release kind of like these edutainment kind of um game consoles kind of thing like i just feel like frogger really like i i just keep getting like frogger from this era and like leapfrog stuff just kind of like they kind of just exi they exist alongside each other it, it's pretty weird um, it, it's just like, it's something where like, you know, like, I just feel like Frogger's designs really in, in capture kind of like, I feel like people probably looked at that and kind of imagined like Leapfrog or something around that time. Man, I am rambling. Fairly Odd Parents breaking the rules. I, I had that game. I liked it. I, I, I do like that game. It's not as good as like Battle for Bikini Bottom, but it's still pretty good. I think they did a good job with a lot of the Nickelodeon games back then. Um, 
just kind of been capturing like the style of the shows and, and having you know they had all the voice actors and they had a lot of dialogue and I, I think it was a pretty pretty good time overall uh, and then we have the Game Boy Advance interesting we have Advance Wars 2 and Mario 3 um, oh man they changed up the the format uh, the uh, the actual name is Super Mario Advance 4 Super Mario Brothers 3 but we can see they originally they had other plans. Uh, Fire Emblem made its way over. Uh, yeah, they don't even mention Melee or something here. Uh, part of me, like, I don't really know if this really would have happened, but part of me would have assumed they would be like, oh, these characters from Super Smash Bros. Melee or something like that. Uh, but Mario and Luigi, uh, they didn't have the full title of Superstar Saga yet, but a very interesting uh, original logo. Uh, it looks like they were really leaning into the fact that... Uh, uh, the Superstar Saga had the Bean Bean Kingdom and whatnot, and, and this logo really seems to, to go along with that. Uh, and potentially they were just going to call it Mario and Luigi, which, you know, kind of kind of works, because the subtitle Superstar Saga just kind of completes the, the, the title a little bit more, because the title of Mario and Luigi feels a little barren by itself. Superstar Saga doesn't really tell you anything. Uh, it's kind of a nothing subtitle, but it at least makes the title feel a little more complete. Uh, sort of mana. Uh, WarioWare Inc. Uh, Mega Micro Games. Uh, I beat this game like within the past year. I never beat it before, but it, it's such an easy game to beat. So I was like, yeah, yeah, why not? I'll do it. Um, still one of the best ones. I mean, like every every WarioWare game is good, but uh, still, like you know, just like with the amount of just stuff, just like being the first of its kind, it's just it, it was crazy. Uh, absolutely fantastic game. Final Fantasy Tactic Attack Tactics Advance. Castlevania Aria of Shadow. Uh, or, no, Sorrow. I'm sorry. Uh, just crazy how much Castlevania stuff they were pump pumping out uh, for the Game Boy Advance at the time. Um, they were just doing so much on that thing. And, like, look at this. <laughs> look at this. Uh, just showing that the Game Boy Advance can and can't do whatever you want. Yeah, so uh, they, they were they were trying a lot of stuff here. Uh, Splinter still seems like it's a 2D platformer with kind of these uh, first-person sections every now and then. And then 007 Nightfire is a straight-on first-person shooter in the Game Boy Advance, which is pretty nuts. Uh, Onimusha Tactics and Dragon Ball Z, uh, Legacy of Goku 2. And then Sonic Advance 2 and Sonic Pinball Party. Uh, there's definitely a lot of... Uh, I mean, like, this was a good generation for Sonic. I mean, like, even then, like, you know, uh, I think during the 360 era was when, like, Sonic really started to be, like, uh, <laughs> you know, like... It, it was no longer like, ah, you just might not like Sonic anymore. Like, no, nah, there were some legitimately pretty pretty stinky games in there. Uh, I, I think during the GameCube era, like, yeah, like, you know, like, you're not going to like every Sonic game, but I think there was an argument to be made with them. Like, you know, you may not like Shadow the Hedgehog, but I think there's an argument to be made there um, that it's just like, ah, you may like it or something. I think there was enough games, like, after this era that were like, uh, all right, this, this might not be good at all. Um, but, uh... Yeah, Sonic Pinball Party is interesting. It's like one of those things where um, they did pretty much like a uh, straight on just Sega thing, but they just they just named it Sonic just for better better sales, pretty much. Uh, Crash Bandicoot Entranced, uh, very cool uh, era for Crash Bandicoot, just kind of taking uh, the Crash Bandicoot formula and translating it over to kind of a 2D setup, and it worked really well. And then there's the Incredible Hulk. Star Wars, Flight of the Falcon, Super Puzzle Fighter 2, uh, which is really cool. We got uh, the sports titles, as usual. Uh, and then DKC, Donkey Kong Country. Very odd port, which is how bright all the sprites are. Which is, they, they had to make it, um, they, had, they had to make it, uh, like, bright just for the, uh, the old school Game Boy Advance with no backlight. Um, but man, like, it just looks odd to see Donkey Kong Country with kind of like all, all the brights with like the contrast pumped up. Uh, Sega Rally Championship, which that, that's interesting to see. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Pokemon Pinball and Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. It's very weird that that is kind of like at the end of like the Game Boy Advance games. You'd think that'd be at the very start, uh, just because it's Pokemon, but uh, I guess it's there. And then Pokemon Pinball. Uh, I wish they did more stuff like that uh, with Pokemon these days. I mean, like, they're starting to do stuff with, like, new Pokemon Snap and whatnot, but it feels like, you know, new Pokemon Snap was kind of an outlier. They're, they're more so, like, 
any kind of spin-off kind of thing they're, they're, they'd rather put on mobile. And I think if Pokemon Pinball comes back, I think it might be something along the lines of how they did Pokemon Shuffle, which is kind of like a uh, kind of a free-to-play variant of the Pokemon uh, Troze series, like them just kind of taking old stuff and just trying to turn it into a smartphone game, pretty much. Like, I can imagine them trying to do a Pokemon Pinball game, and it's free-to-play, and it's on mobile, but it also might be on Switch as well. Like, eh, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah, pretty much the exact same games. Uh, most of the exact same games that we saw, at least Wolverine's Revenge and uh, Ninja Turtles from GameCube, both the Game Boy Advance versions. Uh, but then we have Mortal Kombat Tournament Edition, which, uh... Wow. <laughs> is this like a collection of games or like a, uh, a port of like MK3 or something like that? Uh, I'm not actually sure. But uh, Mega Man and Base. This was the first uh, way we got this game in North America because it was originally on uh, Super Famicom only. And uh, it has never been re-released since pretty much. Uh, which I think is unfortunate, but it's also like this, this is one of the uh, more controversial Mega Man games just because like it, it's not as well designed as a lot of the other ones. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it, it's interesting. I wish they would have included it on like one of the Mega Man Legacy collections or something, though. Uh, I really wish they just kind of like took those collections and just like included everything they possibly could. I really wish they they kind of completed those a little bit more. And then the Mega Man Battle Network games, these were everywhere back then, and uh, they were trying to do the Pokemon setup where they had two different versions, which is interesting. I feel like Pokemon is the only series these days that can really do that. Um, cause like Fire Emblem tried it, Yokai Watch tried it, but at the end of the day, Pokemon is kind of the only franchise that can still get away with those dual releases. We had, uh, uh, Frogger's Journey on, uh, on Game Boy Advance. Uh, and, uh, I, I, I played, uh, oh my god, what was it? Fro Frogger's Advent- oh, I was it Frogger's Adventures? I think it was like the first one. It was the first one in Game Boy Advance. I had that one and I, can, I, I never got past the first stage and I have no idea why because I was a stupid ass kid. Uh, Spyro, uh, Shrek wreaking havoc, uh, Need for Speed. Uh, I played Break into Rules on Game Boy Advance as well. Uh, I, I don't remember nearly as much about this game. I didn't like it nearly as much as the Game Boy, uh, GameCube one, but I don't remember hating it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a different logo from what, uh, from what was originally... Uh, what, what we what we finally got. Uh, and I find it interesting that the, the GameCube section didn't have a logo, but this one does. Um, Crazy Taxi on Game Boy Advance. There's a lot of random stuff that's like, you kind of forget it came out on Game Boy Advance. Even like Lufia. Like there, there's a lot of random stuff that's just like, whoa, what? Like Jet Grind Radio, like what the hell? Uh, and more Drome Racers, except this one is called Lego Drome Racers. And then Simpsons Road Rage, I had that as a kid. Uh, very interesting. It just like how how good it ran, just for being kind of a 3D game, is pretty interesting. Um, and uh, once again, another uh, another setup of just like what the hell was going on with the Game Boy Advance at the time. Holy shit, wings! Woody Woodpecker in Crazy Castle Five, uh, Space Channel Five on Game Boy Advance. There's so much random junk, and then that's it. And yeah, this is. This is a very interesting era uh, for Nintendo. Uh, it, it just felt like they had like pretty much everything going on around this time. Uh, they, they were just pumping out as much as possible. It's just insane how many games are coming out. But you know, the game the game industry is different. Where it's just like a lot of these publishers can't put out as money. They'd rather put a lot of time and effort into uh, less games. So then they have more games come out that are like really big AAA stuff. Um, instead of just pumping out a bunch of smaller games. Um, but I kind of miss it. I really do miss this era. It just felt like everything had a chance to be a big success and everything had a chance to find an audience. Um, and we still have that today, These, but I, I'm talking kind of like from the bigger publishers, like like an Activision or, or an EA or whatnot. It was just the fact that they were willing to kind of put out these smaller titles. Uh, and yeah, and, and it's really cool to just see like these early these early game games that may have never came out, like uh, Nintendo Puzzle Collection, and you know, it's the companion title, Celebrity Deathmatch. 